Uh, President Alan Rock of the University of Ottawa is here with us today and he's going to moderate uh, and keep in check as best as he possibly can the epivescent uh, Ian Care. Uh, Alan, uh, many of you know Alan. Um, I just want to say that uh, the work that he has done uh, when he was Health Minister and in public service uh, for Ottawa and for Canada is, is really wonderful. You're a wonderful person and we're really lucky to have had you uh, as the president. He's got another year or so to go, right? Um, I've just been lobbying for him in that time frame to get us a new building, Celine. Uh, he, he said he had to go get some lunch at that point. Uh, he's a diplomat, a diplomat at heart. So can you give it up for uh, Ian, uh, Alan Rock, please? Woo! Thank you, Colleen. Merci, Colleen. Uh, you know, I can see having seen the program of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, this is something I should have attended before I became Minister of Health. I would have done, uh, would have been a lot more oriented to my, to my job and my responsibilities. Il me fait grand plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à l'Université d'Ottawa. Uh, malheureusement, je n'étais pas ici hier, ni ce matin, mais il me fait grand plaisir uh, d'être ici cet après-midi et de voir un si grand nombre de personnes d'ici et d'ailleurs intéressées dans ces sujets uh, tellement importants. I want to congratulate the organizers, the organizing committee, for the remarkable they did, uh, job they did in putting this conference together, particularly Laurie and Hardcastle, uh, uh, ably assisted by a Colleen Flood. Uh, terrific work, and thank you so much to you and all of your colleagues who've uh, put a terrific conference together. Three days of outstanding panels um, in, involving remarkable scholars uh, with an insightful analysis of some of the most important questions arising from health law and of course its many applications. This occasion provides me also with the opportunity, if you'll indulge me for a moment, to express um, our pride here at the University of Ottawa in the strength and the quality of our law school's health law group and of course our Center for Health Law, Policy and Ethics. It is a really a fabulous group. And thanks to all of you for being part of this. Your research and your writing, your teaching, your mentoring are enriching our understanding of the legal dimensions of health and health care while preparing the next generation of leaders in the health sector, a sector whose importance is measured not just in the remarkable percentage of our GDP devoted to health and health care, but also the prominence of the issue in the minds of Canadians time and again, their principal policy preoccupation. And of course, as to the future, well, that's what this conference is all about, the future of health law. And um, judging by the topics, judging by the subjects on your agenda, that future is going to be uh, very busy as well as very challenging. Uh, one of the reasons for that, of course, is that health law never really deals with health alone. It's always coupled with considerations of other subjects, whether it's human rights, uh, privacy, intellectual property, or indeed the Constitution. So those whose focus is health law will also be interested in the many other fields that it touches, as well as the many other disciplines of study that it engages. Indeed, at the University of Ottawa, ici à l'Université, le sujet de santé est partagé par toutes les facultés, et que ce soit la faculté de sciences, ou génie, euh, médecine, euh, droit, bien sûr, euh, le sujet de santé est omniprésent sur le campus avec les perspectives assez différentes, mais euh, toutes vitales dans ce contexte-là. Our speaker at this session is a conspicuous example of that interdisciplinary feature of health law. Ian Kerr holds a Canada Research Chair in Ethics, Law and Technology here at the University of Ottawa. He's a professor in our Faculty of Law, but with cross appointments in medicine, philosophy, and information studies. His areas of scholarship and teaching include privacy and surveillance, and human-machine mergers. And he approaches these subjects in a context that includes concern about civil liberties, 
about moral and ethical dimensions and, of course, human rights. In fact, Oxford University Press recently published his book, Lessons from the Identity Trail, which deals with questions that are bound to become more and more prominent given the events of this past couple of weeks and the tragedies in Beirut, Paris, and beyond. The intersection of public and private sector surveillance with civil liberties and human rights. Those are tough questions that Ian has dealt with extensively. Mais à part des, des projets de recherche dans lesquels Ian est impliqué, il est aussi très bien euh, reconnu pour euh, ses talents comme enseignant. Il est le récipiendaire de plusieurs prix d'excellence pour his teaching, and he's deeply appreciated by his students for the clarity of his teaching skills. And he's been looking at some very provocative and complex issues arising from emerging technologies in the health sector, and particularly robotics and implantable devices and their legal and ethical implications. You'll see from the screen, he'll be talking about uh, robotic doctors, the robot. We'll see you now. Uh, it is a, a new and a jarring concept to think of a doctor as a robot. Yes, uh, I've known some doctors who are rather taciturn, but robotic I'm not sure. I can say that this presentation is bound to be provocative and interesting and the subject of many conversations afterwards. Would you please join with me in expressing appreciation and welcome to Professor, Professor Ian Kerr. Ian. That's a wonderful and very kind introduction. I thought you were going to say in, in directing everybody to the screen, President Rock, uh, that that's my bio, uh, robots and donuts. We had the donuts last night, now it's time for the robots. Um, I also want to begin uh, by thanking uh, my colleagues around me for this wonderful uh, conference that they've organized, particularly Rosemary, who is unbelievable at logistics and has immense energy and talent, uh, Lorian as well, of course. The two of them have been fantastic in all of this. And I'd like to thank Colleen for the invitation uh, to speak, uh, uh, particularly this nice opportunity at, at lunch. Um, one of the things that I think about this conference that hasn't been mentioned uh, in much detail yet um, is the way that it coincides sort of in essence with I think what should be thought of as a celebration uh, of the CIHR training program. And when I think of that program, I, I think of three people and two of them are in the room and one of them is on a plane uh, on, his, on his way here. And that is, of course, Jocelyn Downey, uh, Colleen Flood, and Timothy Caulfield, who were instrumental not just in setting up this training program that so many people have benefited from, but really in establishing what is now a well-entrenched community in Canada. And I think everybody in this room uh, owes a debt of gratitude to, to them, and, and of course to others as well, but to them in particular uh, for really building this community that we have now. And I'm really proud to be a part of that community, even if I'm sort of a bit of an outlier uh, within it. So it's great for me to be here, uh, and it's great to be uh, in the same room as President Rock, uh, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. I, I just wanted to ask you, just as I'm getting started, uh, President Rock, if um, you know, in all of your experience as Minister of Health, Ambassador to the UN, President of a university, you must have come across this kind of thing where, you know, there's this thing which is the talk that you agreed to do, title that you agreed to do, and then there's the talk that you go on to do. You, you've experienced that? Okay, good. Well, so anyways, I, I kind of came across this. I hope Colleen Flood doesn't, doesn't get too upset with me for a slight change in direction, but I can't help myself because as I was preparing for this, and as I was poking around on the internet, I saw something that was way cool. And I want to direct your attention to the screen for a moment as I, as I switch slides, um, because I really have to, have to work this into the central theme of my talk. Are you ready? Okay, so you could have laughed a little louder than that. Tim's not in the room. Uh, okay, so I, I, I know you, you think I'm sort of kidding here, but actually I thought that a good topic for me today is, is Gwyneth Paltrow wrong about everything? 
now it's starting to get awkward, right? <laughs> Does he mean it <laughs> or not? Um, uh, Ubaka's in the room somewhere probably, yeah? If, <laughs> you're tweeting it. Good. Well, you're probably Tim's closest colleague who's here. Y you don't think he would mind me mowing his lawn a little bit? Yeah. He's got sort of a relaxed attitude to intellectual property, doesn't he? <laughs> He's an open access kind of guy. Yeah, okay. All right, well then, let's cross that out. Um, you know, strike author name, uh, attribute as one's own. Okay. <laughs> Good. So, um, in, in, in thinking about that, I do actually want to reclaim the title into my own voice. You see, I kind of find it a bit negative, right? Gw is Gwyneth Paltrow wrong about everything? Nobody's wrong about everything. Let's, let's change that, okay? Is Gwyneth Paltrow right about everything? That's a more interesting talk, um, but I don't think it goes far enough. I'm not really a binary person. You know, is she right? Is she wrong? Is it black or is it white? Is it Gwyneth Paltrow? Is it science? Let's, how about this? Is Gwyneth Paltrow mostly right about everything? I can live with that. But I got trained in a background which is philosophy. And so we don't sort of ask questions with yes and no answers. We like counterfactuals, right? So just switch it around a bit here. What if Gwyneth Paltrow is mostly right about everything? Okay? I like that topic. I'm almost there. I just think that, you know, why would we pick on Gwyneth Paltrow? It's a bit of a straw person in this argument, isn't it? I don't really think there's a need to do that. Um, I get the point she is famous and she represents celebrity culture. Um, but why pick on any person at all? And so you think I'm joking around here, but actually there is a link between what I want to talk about uh, today and what Tim has been talking about. And I see that link in a broad concept that we could call medical epistemology. I think part of what Tim will talk to us tonight about, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of guessing ahead, um, is this idea about when and to what extent we can place trust in certain uh, persons or entities that are putting themselves forward as an authority in some sense or using some, uh, some, some you know, network to, to espouse something from a position of authority and to what extent we can know that to be true and to what extent we can trust them in making those kinds of claims, which we might understand as knowledge claims. They're probably not made in that strong of a sense. Anyway, I don't want to talk about Gwyneth Paltrow. I want to talk about this, does anybody recognize who that is? How many people recognize who that is? A couple of people, how many don't recognize who that is? That's Watson, okay? Watson is the avatar, Watson is the face of one of the most powerful and expensive computing systems ever made in the world, a, a parallel massive computer system by IBM um, that's really become quite famous. And in a way, we could talk about this hybrid between uh, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Watson. If you look at Watson's Google images, you see Watson has just as many. And they're not as fashionable. They're kind of nerd, nerd blue. Um, but in any event, um, I just want to make one more tweak on the title then, and we're almost there. Is what if Gwyneth Watson is mostly right about everything? Okay. And then maybe we should just change the subtitle to When Artificial Intelligence and Science Clash. All right, so that's where I want to go. I want to talk a little bit more about Watson, and since many of you don't know, I'll just slow down and give you one of IBM's slides about Watson. So Watson um, represents a, a field of study that's known as cognitive computing. And the idea is that we take strategies from what we understand about human cognition, and we try to replicate some of those strategies in machine learning. And by virtue of doing so, because machines have such big processors and can process information very quickly, we're working towards trying to see if we can get intelligence out of them. Okay? And so what you see here is a sort of three-step process a la, a la IBM. First, and, and this point is really important to, to grasp here, this is what's exciting and at the same time I'm going to suggest scary about this field is that Watson, unlike other computer systems before, understands things in natural language. Or at least, I don't know about understands, but certainly works in natural language. What does that mean? That means that whereas at one time, in order to get computers to do work for us, we had to code them. We had to code them in particular ways. And all that the machine could do was attached to the way that it was programmed and coded. Now, all of a sudden, machine systems are learning natural language. We don't have to code them. We can feed them anything in natural language, in audio form, uh, in text form. 
um, various different ways to get them natural language. And that's really a different barrier. So when IBM built a computer system in 1999 uh, called Deep Blue that beat Gary Kasparov at chess, that was thought to be a major moment uh, in the future of AI. But looking back on that, you know, computers are, do linear thinking very well. They do computation very well. But what they haven't done very well up until now is natural language. So, so Watson sort of works with natural language. And according to IBM, at least in this sort of promo type slide, it generates and evaluates hypotheses. I think that's a bit of scientific uh, anthropomorphism going on here. Uh, it doesn't really generate hypotheses in a scientific sense. But what it does do is it runs some algorithms on whatever it's responding to, and it develops what metaphorically we might call a confidence level. Uh, so that it can have, in essence, something like a meta-reflection about which answer it wants to give because it can weigh the different weights of confidence that it has in the responses that it has. And then thirdly, it has a machine learning aspect. It can adapt and learn from users. So uh, how many people would like to see Watson in action? I hope that's a yes, because I'm going to do it anyways. That was rhetorical. Welcome back. Ken, you've got your signaling device ready, I see. Here are the categories for you to select from in Double Jeopardy. First off, Etude Brute. Next. Hedgehog Podge. Don't worry about it. The Art of the Steel. Cambridge. And finally, Church and State, with each of those words in quotation marks. Start us off. Let's try Don't Worry About It all the way down at 2,000, Alex. It's just acne. You don't have this skin infection, also known as Hansen's disease. Watson. What is leprosy? You are right. Etude Brute for 1,600. Music fans wax rhapsodic about this Hungarian's transcendental etudes. Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. Don't worry about it. For 1600. You're just a little stiff. You don't have this painful mosquito-borne joint illness with a Swahili name. Watson. What is dengue fever? Dengue fever, correct. Etude brute for 1200. Paganini's 24 Capricci set the standard for etudes for this instrument. Watson. What is violin? Good. 2000, same category. From 1911 to 1917, this romantic Russian composed etude tableau for piano. Watson. Who is Rachmaninoff? Rachmaninoff is correct, and that adds to your lead. You're at 13,400. Go again. Don't worry about it. For 1,200. You just need a little more sun. You don't have this hereditary lack of pigment. Watson. What is albinism? Good. Cambridge for 1600. Answer, <laughs> daily double. What are you going to wager? I'll wager $6,435. <laughs> I won't ask. I won't ask. Here's the clue for you, Watson. The chapels at Pembroke and Emmanuel Colleges were designed by this architect. Who is Sir Christopher Wren? You are right, and that adds to your total. Okay, you see the IBM team, they're very happy, <laughs> totally pleased with Watson's performance. And really, it's a stunning accomplishment if you think about it, because Jeopardy is a game that's filled with puns and plays on words and context. And Watson did pretty well, uh, I dare to say, and in that little segment that I showed you, there was two hum human beings who looked a little robotic to me. Um, and, and that's really what happened. Those, were, those two, by the way, were the all-time champions of Jeopardy, uh, Ken Jennings and, and Brad Rutter. So anyways, the day after that aired um, across the world, also across the world in every major newspaper, this, was, this is the ad that was in uh, the, the Globe and Mail, um, was a full page ad in every major newspaper from IBM saying it's the humans who win, okay? And I guess it's important to start to see here that Jeopardy was not just this random te uh, test case. This wasn't about like beating uh, a machine, beating a person at a game, right? You don't, you don't spend that much money trying to do that. And what we started to see the day after was what the end game for IBM was. If you read that ad, the, the print's too small, you would see some of the things that it says, but in particular, that Watson will now be used after having mopped up the humans in jeopardy. Uh, Watson will now be used to solve some of the world's most enticing problems, and in particular, they cite healthcare, finance, law, and academia. 
Okay, so this is this is the end game uh, uh, of Watson, and I think it's useful just to sort of see a little bit more. And I'm just going to play you one more short clip um, of what IBM thinks I Watson's Watson about. Has the potential to transform many industries. There's so much content out there. Information overload is really the problem of our day in many ways. There's lots of data out there. Now the trick is, how do you get intelligence out of it, not just noise? We decided that we needed to build a system using our Power 7 series that could extract knowledge at a much faster rate from enormous amounts of data than human beings or any other computer system can do. Watson represents a way to look at all this data and extract the needle in the haystack, the key insight that's useful. While it's playing the game show Jeopardy as its test case, there are lots of other domains where people want questions answered. Healthcare is certainly one of those places. Suppose you're a clinician, a doctor, a nurse trying to diagnose a very complex case. You have some ideas, um, but in order to confirm your hypothesis, you need a lot of information. So many different kinds of information to consider, from journals and abstracts, which are new information that's coming out daily, to classic reference books, to specifics about a particular case history. The amount of valid, useful information that will make a difference in a patient's life, uh, it just has exploded to the extent that it's impossible to keep up with that. So we need tools that glean the best of that. And most of the data, if you will, on how a patient's doing is in natural language, not coded data. And I think that plays to the strength of Watson. In seconds, doctors everywhere in the world are going to be able to find out what are the best treatments and how do I ensure best outcomes. That's just one example of how we hope to revolutionize entire industries with this new capability. Business people would say we can make things more productive, more efficient, more optimized. Others would say uh, we can address some real societal issues. It's limitless, the number of things you could potentially apply this to. And it changes the paradigm in which we work with computers. Life is really about questions and answers. But Watson can now help us get some of those answers and make us smarter individually, which will then create a smarter planet. And everybody lived happily ever after. Uh, well, I, I guess I would suggest that every utopia has an equal and opposite uh, dystopia. And it's interesting if you go back to the actual Jeopardy match, when, 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 when the world champion of Jeopardy, Ken Jennings, lost uh, at the end, and this was the final Jeopardy, his answer, underneath, you'll see underneath his, his final Jeopardy answer, he says, I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. Okay, this phrase that he uses is in fact uh, popularized in a 1994 episode of The Simpsons uh, in which the local news anchor Kent Brockman, for those of you who are Simpsons fans, um, mistakenly believed that the earth was being taken over by a powerful race of giant ants. Fearing for his life, he announced on the air, I, for one, welcome my new, our new insect overlords. This, of course, was itself a reference uh, to H.G. Wells' uh, uh, Empire of the Ants. Of course it was. Um, and the point here, I guess, to think about is that IBM's Watson success raises a bunch of questions about what role humans will occupy once robots are seen and understood as experts that are capable of performing multitudes of tasks that were traditionally delegated uh, from human experts and performing them well. On the one hand, it seems that Jennings seems to be enthusiastically accepting the idea that Watson is the successor of human beings in dominance, at least in the game of Jeopardy. Uh, on the other hand, he also recognizes that there's a central trade-off that's going on here once we start to create these machine systems to which we attribute expertise uh, and to which we delegate human control. And so I don't really know quite how to phrase the problem I have here. On the one hand, I'm taking the words from, from, a, from an Asimov novel. On the one hand, it could be nothing at all. On the other hand, it could be the end of humanity, right? And so in thinking about this uh, and paying a little bit of homage to Asimov in this kind of thing, I, I want to suggest, in fact, that we're not totally that far off. I, I want to rely a little bit on the work of a scholar, a mathematics professor from the University of Berkeley, 
a young scholar. If you squint, for my Ottawa colleagues, if you squint a little bit and you look at him, he looks like a young Jeremy De Beer, maybe. Um, but in any event, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what this prof professor was thinking about in thinking about probabilities, permutations, possibilities of all of this. This is what he said. He said, first let us postulate that the computer scientists succeed in developing intelligent machines that can do things better than humans can do them. In that case, presumably the work will be done by vast, highly organized systems of machines and no human effort will be necessary. Either of two cases might occur. The machines might be permitted to make all of their own decisions without human oversight or else control over the machines will be retained. Let's look at both of those possibilities. The first possibility, the idea that machines would be permitted to make decisions. Okay? Here what, 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 what the author says is people will let machines make more decisions for them simply because machine-made decisions will bring better results than human-made decisions. Eventually, a stage may be reached at which the decisions necessary, are necessary to keep the system running will be so complex that human beings will be incapable of making them intelligently. At that stage, the machines will be in effective control. Sounds a bit like a, a bit of dystopia coming our way here, um, but I think at the same time, let's think about some of the tools that we use every day. I think almost everybody, if not today, maybe yesterday, maybe the day before, was on Google. Google works on an, a search-based algorithm, the programmers of which cannot understand or predict what the algorithm will do. There are too many complex inputs that go into it. No human being could predict, foresee, or understand, in every case, what, what the outputs of that algorithm will be. Think about that on, for a second. The second scenario is that humans will retain control over the machines. Here's what he says. The average person may have control over certain private machines of their own, such as a car or a personal computer. I think Google's working on a car that would um, eliminate that possibility as well. I think the days of personal computers um, now not being, uh, or being solely within our control is, is a thing of the past. Uh, but look, control over large systems of machines will be in the hands of a tiny elite, just as today, but with two differences. Due to massive improvements, uh, improvements of techniques, the elite will have greater control over the masses, and because human work will no longer be necessary, the masses will be superfluous, a useless burden on the system. Okay, that's heavy stuff, and you go into the notes of this person, and you take a look, and you start to think about it and try and understand it. Um, look, President Rock is even in the notes there. Um, you'll see that, in fact, these were uh, the workings of somebody famous who you've all heard of but just not thought of, and that is Theodore Kaczynski, who was a professor at Berkeley in mathematics before he wrote the Unabomber Manifesto in 1999. I actually, since I read that in 1999, have been plagued a little bit by this idea. I'm actually concerned about this idea that we're delegating too much to machine systems, and not even just machine systems, but sets of protocols and administrative and bureaucratic protocols which will actually relinquish our control in meaningful ways and ways which will have significant com uh, complications and outcomes for us. So in, in thinking about this, there's sort of two things that I want to talk about. Um, and, and two questions, and this is based on some research that I've been doing with a colleague of mine, Dr. Jason Miller, uh, and the two questions that I want to sort of focus on here, and I'll try and keep it s straightforward and simple uh, for the time that I have. The first question is, uh, what is our justification uh, for relinquishing uh, control and delegating human decision making over to machines? What kind of things would justify us doing that in important contexts? Okay? And some contexts may be easier to deal with than others. The second kind of question that we've been working on is how does that first question bear on questions of, uh, or determinations of responsibility in cases where human robot, there's a human-robot disagreement and there's out undesirable outcomes. Okay? And what we've been trying to suggest in sort of thinking through these scenarios is that there's a particular thing that takes place, which is that there is a normative pull um, that affects us uh, insofar as we are, we, are, we are drawn towards what we call today evidence-based practice. And so that's, that's the kind of thing uh, I think we'll hear Tim talk about tonight. You know, we've got to rely on evidence and evidence-based practice and that that's important. Um, but what becomes interesting is when we move from an era of human experts and what that means to, to have expertise uh, and to provide evidence in, in support of claims that we are trying to assess the medical epistemology of, 
versus things like Watson, which is what, what, what has been called an expert system. These things, as I've suggested already, cannot be fully understood in terms of their lines of code. In the same way that human experts, there's a kind of underdetermination in terms of what actually makes them experts. Um, but in any event, especially, this becomes especially tricky when we, when we start to have inputs, for example, all of the data that's on the internet. Right? The whole point of putting this into natural language is that you can then feed into Watson every medical journal that's ever been written, uh, every blog that's on the internet, whether it's by Gwyneth Paltrow or somebody else. Uh, and Watson will, will, will use its algorithms to predict things. But the important thing to recognize here with Watson and other systems is these systems are in fact unpredictable by design. The whole reason that we use these algorithms is precisely because we as human beings see that they might be able to do these things in a more quick, efficient, productive, profitable way, uh, but in ways that would be different from how we would do it. It's the whole point of why we would delegate things to them. Whether we let go of the wheel and allow Google to drive our cars, uh, whether we, as I was just discussing a couple of weeks ago at the United Nations General Assembly, whether we're willing to uh, delegate kill decisions to machine automated machine systems, the so-called killer robots that some of us are fighting in a campaign against. These are really important questions and one of the central reasons why these things become uh, so, so important is because what we're delegating is to machines where the whole, the whole outcome is not necessarily known to us. All we have is a certain sense of their past performance. And so it's interesting if you think about uh, what happened with Watson in Jeopardy, if, if there's any nerds in the audience who are watching this one in real time when it was on, one of the things that happened was uh, Alex Trebek provided a clue. Uh, Alex Trebek is an alumni of ours, isn't he, Al? Um, Alex Trebek uh, provided a clue um, which talked about um, this U.S. airport, da 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 da. And Watson said, What is Toronto? Okay? And you, they, they zoomed in on all the IBM folks and they were like both mortified uh, but also stumped. They didn't know possibly how this happened. In the months and couple of years since that took place, they have hypotheses of what happened exactly. But the whole point is that Watson is going to, in, in spite of its success, is going to have unpredictable outcomes. The same is true of Google cars. The same is true of military robots. All of these technologies will have unintended consequences because these things are unpredictable uh, by design. And the important thing to see there is that's a feature not a bug. This is not a malfunctioning of the machine. This is not negligence in any ordinary sense of that. This is what we signed up for. That's the key thing here. And it's useful to think about that a little bit in terms of a discourse that's been going on the last few years that I've been paying attention to. It actually started in, in popular publications and has found its way into actual academic journals. And that is this notion of the end of theory. And what's going on here um, really is sort of two elements. The first, so, we, so we've made this computational turn. We're, uh, we're, we're delegating what we do to algorithms, and the algorithms are performing pretty well. And so we're happy with the performance of the algorithms. But there's two essential elements of what's going on with this computational turn. The first is that knowledge is generated through computation that establishes correlations between different types of data without any claim whatsoever to causal meanings of those correlations. That's the first thing. The second thing is that this knowledge is not discovered in the first place by any testing of any hypothesis against empirical data. Basically, it entails the production of hypotheses, as you sort of saw from Watson, that are inferred from a population of machine uh, computable data. And so really what you see is that to the extent that these things are predictive, their value isn't truth in the traditional analytic sense of something which is tested according to theory. Their value is, and I underscore this point, their performance as prediction machines. We turn things over to the Google car so long as it's performed well, but we don't really necessarily know what it's going to do in particular situations. Okay, so what I'm suggesting here is that as we think about using some of these AI techniques, and IBM wants us to use Watson, um, we have to remember that we're placing a certain kind of faith in the machine. Um, it is what Robert Piercig, who wrote the, the, the great book in the 1970s, which if you've never read before, you should absolutely put on your reading list, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. He referred to this when he was talking about science as the church of reason. 
And that's what's going on here. Except now the church of reason is the power of algorithms. So long as they continue to work. It's kind of a weird version of Hume's, uh, David Hume's style of skepticism, but now with robots. Okay, so what I've said is that the power of algorithms uh, and our ability to use them is based primarily on their success. And in that sense, interestingly, some people will say that's an evidence-based practice, right? Because we looked at its success, there's evidence of its success in the past, moving forward. But there's no theory, there's nothing underlying it that we know about that's making it decide uh, in the way that we want to decide. So I want to talk about this just for my, my, my last um, remaining minutes, um, sort of moving forward by looking at this uh, in, a, in a particular kind of way and just sort of see where we're heading in the future. Google invented the idea of using banjo music and this sort of happy music around here. But what you're watching here, um, well, you can see what you're watching. You're seeing somebody do surgery on a grape, except that that somebody is a robot, okay? Where we're at currently is that this robot is in fact semi-autonomous. One way of describing that is to say there's a human that's in the loop on this. But as we get better and better at these things, just like we've seen with the Google car, there's going to be more and more impetus to say that there will be less mistakes when surgeries are done by robots than when surgeries are done by doctors. And so as we watch this in amazement, and we sort of think of the world-altering contrivances that we are facing in this day as we stand on the precipice of robots entering our society and being used in a co-robotic human-robot interaction, we have to start thinking about some of these things and, and the challenges that they present because this is pretty compelling when you look at this. Okay, we'll just watch it finish up. I won't mention all of the lawsuits against Da Vinci right now. Um, they're, they are compelling. I had a student put together a memo that's very long, in fact. Um, but the point is, you, there's, a, there's, there's something to be amazed with about that, because it's a direction we're heading in. And like every other technology that we've seen in its infancy, we do get better. I don't have to spend a lot of time talking to people in this room to remember the first computer that they ever had and then to think about their computer now, to think about the storage that they once had on some five and a quarter floppy compared to the, the terabytes of data we have now. We're making huge progress. And to take it back to Watson for a moment, this is the headline that appeared now more than a year ago. IBM's Watson is better at diagnosing cancer than human doctors. That's the direction we're moving in. As I've said, so far, the approach to, to utilizing these technologies is to leave the human being in the loop. And you heard the people from IBM say, Watson is a tool, right? And that's an important feature of our adoption of it, remembering that the human beings are in control. The question I have is a question about what happens when the machine systems are better at doing things than us, whether it's a surgery or whether it's actually diagnosing cancer. Okay? And what I'm going to suggest to you is that some very interesting questions arise, both from the perspective perspective of law and ethics and broader policy questions when we start to think about these areas of what I'm calling a human-robot disagreement. So let's imagine Watson carrying out some complex um, kind of uh, diagnoses of a very uh, unusual situation. Uh, and you have, you have Watson who's doing this uh, to aid a doctor who is the most responsible physician, or whatever the, the, the terminology will be in the jurisdiction you're dealing with. And so the doctor's still in the loop. The doctor comes up with one answer, Watson comes up with a different answer. There's a dilemma. The doctor considers the fact that Watson has been right for the last thousand predictions, let's say. And the doctor considers their own frailty as a human being. Okay? I want to start thinking about what happens in these cases of, uh, of, of disagreement. And for me, I can't help but picture doctors like this one, right? Who have that sort of human element and that human instinct and, and want to follow their heart in these situations, uh, especially when there doesn't seem to be good evidence to the contrary. Is, is, is Watson's past behavior going to be sufficient to overturn the doctor in deciding in these cases? I would suggest to you that a doctor 
And we are on the precipice of this happening to doctors. I would suggest to you that a doctor in this situation is going to feel the angst of Abraham when they are charged with making that decision, right? They hear the voice of God on the mountain and they have to decide what to do. Do I follow what the algorithm says? Do I follow what I say? And so me and my colleague have been sort of thinking about how do we deal with situations in those knowing that in some cases, the robot system's gonna be right. In some cases, the human system's gonna, the human person's going to be right. And there are gonna be points in time where they both agree and get the right outcome, and there's gonna be times when they both agree and get the wrong outcome. So we've sort of been thinking about this on the context of a matrix, and I don't wanna get into this because it's lunchtime, uh, and, and you guys have been going nonstop this whole conference. Try keeping up with Colleen Flood as a colleague. Okay? This is just, you guys have two and a half days of this. Okay, so anyway, um, in thinking about this, this, this little matrix represents those options that I just sort of told you about. And the thing to think about is the fact that in a situation where Watson or the Watson-like system comes up with one answer and the doctor comes up with the other answer, they disagree on this, and Watson is, is, would have been right, but the doctor selected the other way, I think there's going to be a pretty clear case there for saying that there's some responsibility uh, on the humans for allowing the robots to do what the robots chose to do. But flip it around the other way, um, where, where Watson is wrong uh, and the human is, is right, uh, or well, the human would have been right, but the human followed Watson in that case. Okay? I think what we're going to see there in those situations becomes really tricky because on the one hand, evidence-based practice would tell you to follow Watson, but then Watson got it wrong. So these are going to be kind of really tricky situations, you know, from a perspective of, of liability um, and maybe from the perspective of moral responsibility as well. But I think actually the deeper point has nothing to do with the niceties. This, this is a good law student exam. But I think the real deep question actually is the question of how do we stop from going down the road when the machine systems become better and better at us than us at doing things, and yet we recognize this moral dilemma of relinquishing control to the machines, of delegating responsibility to the machines in ways that it looks hard to, to, to see us uh, re regain that control. And in that sense, I kind of find what Professor Theodore Kaczynski, the Luddite, um, the crazy person who murdered many people through sending bombs through the letter, to, through the mail to them, including an IBM executive, um, I think there's still a compelling point underlying the, the thesis that he's trying to put forward there, which is we can see ourselves drifting into a state uh, uh, of where we've given up control because evidence-based practice tells us that it makes sense to do so. So these questions of responsibility are, are really challenging. And in thinking about these, uh, the important point is, and I'm not gonna go through the, that, I'll get to, the, to what I think is uh, the thing to say here which is our takeaway from this and, and, and my own thinking in all of this is this leads to a kind of Asimovian paradox, right? The way I state it is this. The normative pull that would lead to the decision to delegate to the machines, namely evidence-based reasoning, ultimately generates a system in which we now have no obvious evidentiary rationale for explaining the outcome generated by the intelligent machine. All we have is a hindsight case. Right? And as we all know, hindsight is 2020. Um, I think these are kinds of questions that loom on the horizon. I was sort of a bit nervous about coming up here and doing this, especially after both of the panels this morning, which I found deeply compelling and shared the same emotional states that you did. Um, in some ways, it's very easy to see these things as first world problems, to use that kind of a phrase, and to say, you know, how is this, how can we even talk about these issues with robots when there are people who don't have base, you know, basic health needs uh, fulfilled? Um, I prefer to think, though, that we have to be thinking about all of these issues, and I do think that this set of issues will affect the other set of issues, because it's clear to me that these systems are put in place with a view to maximalization, to increasing profit, to increasing efficiency, uh, and that all of those kinds of considerations are going to be the drivers of why we decide to let go of the wheel. They're going to be the drivers of why we maybe will decide uh, not to prohibit people from letting machines decide who gets to kill in warfare. And they may be the driver of, of allowing some of these kinds of decisions in the medical space. 
For what it's worth, uh, as someone who spent a bit of time last year in, in the medical context, um, my view is that we're already sort of seeing some of these things without the fancy robots. We're seeing protocols being followed by doctors, sometimes uncritically. There's lots of great doctors, and most doctors really try to do what they can within the system. But it's a lot easier to follow the hospital protocols for what seems to be the case going on here. And that's a kind of automation uh, that, that leads to, I think, similar kinds of things that we need to think about. So I hope in all of this you will see um, that the issues that are on the horizon here with robotics and artificial intelligence are things that I think people uh, in, a, in, 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 in the health law space should have on their radar. I hope maybe that this inspires some of the students in this room to think about maybe taking some of these things on as a project. And if I can make a last sort of, I guess it's kind of a political plug, um, my my. Um, tendency to having pulled back a little bit from doing more stuff in the health space has had in, in some part to do with a decision that was made by our tri-council, which was to draw a, a bright line between, on the one hand, stuff that is social sciences and humanities research and stuff that is health research. So you have to put yourself in one box or the other. I think the kind of work that I'm doing here doesn't neatly fit into our current approach at CIHR, which is why I've tended to stay on the shirk side of things. One of the things I think you'd see is there's not that many people who are first and foremost Shirk scholars in the room. Uh, and that's not to say they're not interested, and that's not to say they're not working on things that, you, that this audience would benefit from, and reciprocally so the other way. So if you're tweeting, tweet out something to Shirk uh, to talk about the importance of, re of recognizing the social sciences and the humanities in thinking about some of these issues. Thank you very much. It's been a great opportunity to speak to you all. So, bonjour uh, tout le monde. Uh, je m'appelle Adam Houston. I'm a doctoral student here uh, at the U of O, poking away at uh, diet link non-communicable disease in a global health context. But more, more importantly, uh, un, un gros merci à nos experts. It's really a privilege to, to spend lunch listening to experts on, uh, on R2D2 and R2P2. Uh, <laughs> so we do have some tokens of uh, appreciation, although uh, I, I think Colleen just scribbled out the name Tim Caulfield on this one, but <laughs> there we go. I'll keep it for tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much.